The Kleiza category for a monad T on a category E gives us another way to produce an adjoint situation from a monad. Last time we looked at the question, does every monad come from a joint situation? And the answer is yes. The eilenberg mohr construction provided us a solution. However, is it uniquely determined? Here the answer in general is no. In this section we look at a different construction of how to obtain an adjoint situation from a given monad T. This construction is called the Kleisley category, which we denote by E subscript T. Its objects are the same as the category E, and a morphism in the Kleisley category F from X to X prime is the same as an E morphism F from X to TX. Since the morphism is denoted by the same letter F, we will use the arrow with a line down the middle to indicate a morphism in the Kleisley category. Since the morphisms are atypical for a category, the composition of morphisms are also a bit unusual. Given a compatible pair of morphisms, F followed by G in the Kleisley category, we define the composition, distinguished by a subscript T, to be the composition in E of F followed by TG followed by the multiplication of the monad. We can see that the form of the composition is correct but we still need to verify the axioms for a category, namely associativity of composition and the identity laws hold. For associativity, given a compatible triple of morphisms, H, G, F, in the Kleisley category, and I should stop here and note that when I write composition in this form, it is of the opposite order of how I write, write it in arrow form as above. It's my idiosyncrasy and I apologize for it and I hope that doesn't cause any confusion, but I'll be consistent with these two different notations. So by H, G, F, I mean F followed by G followed by H, as indicated here. So unwinding the definition to composition E, and applying T to the composite, we obtain mu x triple prime T mu x triple prime T squared H T G F. We will then use the naturality of mu as indicated by this commuting diagram on the right, as well as the associativity laws of the monad as indicated by the composition on the left to make the substitutions of mu x triple prime mu T x triple prime for mu x triple prime t mu x triple prime and then th mu x double prime for mu tx triple prime t squared h giving us the following but the composite mu x triple prime t g f in e is by definition the composition of g f in the Kleisley category and similarly mu x triple prime tf followed by this morphism is again by definition h gf in the Kleisley category. So we are finished showing associativity. Next the identity morphism on an object x in the Kleisley category is defined to be the unit of the monad on x. Verifying the identity laws for a category we unwind to the composition in E and so we have the pre-composition of the identity on a compatible morphism F in the Kleisley category. And by naturality of eta, we can substitute eta T X F for T F eta X. Then by the unit law for the monad, we have mu X prime eta T X equal to the identity on X prime. And we can then see that it is equal to F. If we postcompose by the identity, we again unwind the definition to a composite in E. And by the other half of the unit law of the monad, we again see that the composition is equal to F. Therefore, the Kleisley category is a well-defined category. Now we are ready to prove that there is an adjoint situation, F subscript T, which is left adjoint to U subscript T, from the Kleisley category to its underlying category E such that this adjoint situation induces the monad T. For the proof, we first need to define the forgetful functor and the free functor. The forgetful functor will take the Kleisley category object X to TX and the morphism F to the E composite TF followed by the multiplication of the monad. To verify that this is a well-defined functor, we need to show that it preserves composition and identities. For composition, given a compatible pair of morphisms in the Kleisley category F followed by G, we apply the forgetful functor to it, 
and by definition we have this equal to the composite in E of TF T squared G T mu X double prime and then mu X double prime. If we apply the forgetful functor to F and G separately and take their composite in E we have TF mu X prime TG followed by mu X double prime. Then these two expressions are equal if and only if the diagram commutes. But this is easy to see if we fill in the diagram with the multiplication morphisms mu x prime and mu x double prime. The left square commutes trivially, the middle square by naturality of the multiplication mu, and the right square by the associativity law for the monad. Therefore we see that composition is preserved. Identities are also preserved by the unit law for the monad. Therefore the forgetful functor is in fact a well-defined functor. The free functor is defined on objects by taking x to x and on morphisms by taking f to the E composition a to x followed by tf, which we see is a morphism in the Claisley category from x to x prime. So it is of correct form. But we still need to verify that the free functor is a well-defined functor. So we look at the free functor acting on the composition f followed by g, which gives us a to x followed by tfg. If we look at the free functor acting on f and g separately and take the composition in the Claisley category, we obtain the following composite in E. However, we can make the substitution of tg followed by t eta x double prime for t eta x prime followed by t squared g by the naturality of eta x prime. Then since t eta x prime followed by the multiplication mu x double prime is the identity because of the unit law for a monad, we have that this composition is equal to a to x tf tg, or a to x followed by t applied to the composite fg, which is the morphism given above. So we see that the free functor preserves composition. The preservation of identities follows from the definition of the free functor and noting that a to x is the identity in the Claisley category. Therefore, the free functor preserves identities and thus it is a well-defined functor. Next we check that the induced endofunctor is the same as t. If we first apply the free functor on the morphism f and then the forgetful functor, we obtain the following composition in e. Then by naturality of eta, we can make the following substitutions. By the unit law for the monad, this reduces to tf. Hence we see that we have equality as above. We can now verify the adjoint situation. We define the unit to be the unit of the monad. By the equality of the induced endofunctor in T, this is well defined. The co-unit is defined to be the identity on Tx. Note that the co-unit is a morphism in the Claisley category, and so a morphism Tx to X in the Claisley category is the same as an E morphism from Tx to Tx, and so it is of the correct form. The triangle identities of the adjoint situation can be verified. We have the first triangle identity occurring in the Claisley category, and thus we can unwind the definition of composition to E compositions and observe that the co-unit is the identity. Therefore, we obtain mu x t a to x a to x. And so by the unit law of the monad, this reduces to a to x, which is equal to the identity on F subscript tx. The other triangle identity is an E, and this reduces by definitions to the multiplication mu x and the unit on tx. And this is the identity on tx by the unit law. But tx is equal to the forgetful functor on x, as we have shown above. So the adjoint situation checks out. Finally, we need to show that the induced multiplication is the same as the multiplication for the monad t. But this is straightforward since the forgetful functor postcomposes a morphism by the multiplication mu and the co-unit, by definition, is the identity in E, which is preserved by T. And that completes the proof.